I legit never thought this day would come. Yet, here we are, about to review Dragon Ball GT. While I have made Dragon Ball GT something of a running joke over the last while as a bit of lighthearted fun, there has always been an element of truth to it. When the original series ended way back when I was a kid, like many others my age, I quickly shifted to Dragon Ball GT thinking it would be more of what I loved about Dragon Ball Z. And at the time, it wasn't. I say at the time because right now I want to review this show as fairly as I possibly can. I haven't seen Dragon Ball GT in maybe 15 years, and I have changed considerably since then. The strong but negative feelings I had for Dragon Ball GT have, much like its relevance in the modern Dragon Ball and anime landscape, faded with time. And at present, I don't really recall much of the story, and my feelings towards it are about as neutral as they ever have been. So, what better time to dive headfirst into the show that ended it all for me when I was a young teenager? A show that pushed me away, frustrated me beyond belief, and admittedly moved me to tears. This is my review of the infamous and intensely controversial Dragon Ball GT. Part 1. The Black Star Dragon Balls. Dragon Ball GT isn't really divided into clean sections like Dragon Ball Super was, so I've decided to follow the arcs as they are defined in the fandom. The first arc being the Black Star Dragon Ball saga that flows from episodes 1 through to 16. And I want to make something clear here from the get-go, having just finished watching these, it's not going to be pretty, so if you're a fan of this arc, I'll try to be fair and explain where my issues are and why. So without further ado, Let's get into it. Dragon Ball GT. The story itself kicks off as Goku finishes up his training with Oob and then sends him on his way. I guess the ending of Dragon Ball Z wasn't worth following up on and Oob wasn't worth exploring right now. This honestly doesn't bother me too much, but really reinforces the notion that Goku's decision to go off for a decade training Oob was a bit of a waste of time. Or at least this is the message the show is sending us right now. A little bit later, the Pilaf gang make it to the lookout somehow and discover the Black Star Dragon Balls. You know, just sitting there. Out in the open. You know, the Dragon Balls that have earth-shattering ramifications if used? The dragon itself, when summoned, is probably the most visually impressive spectacle from this arc. However, Goku interrupts Pilaf, as he kinda sort of wishes Goku was a kid again? I mean, he sort of says it, but not really. I'm not really sure what counts as a wish anymore. But we gotta get the plot moving somehow, I guess. And it sure is a good thing that Goku's clothes became a kid with him too. Once Pilaf finishes using these balls to turn Goku into a little kid again, the balls then disperse throughout the universe. And that's when we hear that that the Earth will be destroyed in exactly one year from when the wish was made if the balls are not gathered again. Now this is where the show loses me even more. I have no earthly idea how these balls really work. I mean, I would assume like the other Dragon Balls, they would have turned to stone along with the other balls once the old guardian had passed. Also, why would their creator have made them to scatter across the universe? How would he, the creator of these Dragon Balls, have been able to gather them seeing as there was no other way to get off of Earth at the time? Also, I have no idea why there's a one year time limit and a consequence of not meeting that time limit too. It seems really arbitrary, only there to provide incentive for Goku, who up until this bombshell hit, was rather indifferent to being young again or to even collect the Dragon Balls again in the first place. I get that the Dragon Balls in this show are a MacGuffin used to make the story work, but they didn't need to be Dragon Balls in this instance. They're already different enough to warrant being their own thing, tying them to objects within a show that has already so many rules to abide by makes things needlessly difficult to work. With that said, the rest of the episode is spent reintroducing old characters that we won't see for the rest of the arc, and most importantly, the character of Pan, someone we will be spending a lot of time with. Episode 2 is the first episode where we will see the pace the series will be moving at. Glacial pace. There's no sense of urgency and the decisions that are made seem excessively juvenile. Goku says that they should use the regular Earth's Dragon Balls to relocate themselves to the Dragon Balls in space, but I say, that's pretty dumb. Why not just wish them to Earth? Did I just make the entire arc pointless? The vast majority of this episode covers very filler-centric stuff like Goku getting kidnapped, Pan pouting over not being let go, and Trunks goofing off of work. Additionally, no one seems to be taking this thing with the balls seriously other than Gohan, Chi-Chi, and Bulma. In reality, the most capable people should go on this life-threatening trip, not the children as a form of discipline. Also, Vegeta has a mustache. I just needed to say that. 
Pan then sneaks out onto the ship before blasting off and is now part of the party. Goku, Trunks, and Pan blast off into space. At this point in my watch through, I really liked that Pan had a reason for leaving, to prove her maturity and independence, and in addition to this motivation has a strong personality. It's not exactly a unique character type or unique personality, but she fills the role well of an immature kid trying to be strong like her relatives. I'm gonna try to go through the episodes faster now, because they get really bad. Episode 3 begins and they land on Imega, and all of a sudden it feels like Star Wars. This subplot sees them ignoring the Dragon Balls that they literally just left to retrieve almost immediately after leaving Earth in order to deal with this planet that shakes people down for money. We then get introduced to Gil, a little robot that now acts as the group's dragon radar. <laughs> Episode 4 begins, and yes, there is a part 2 to this story. And trust me, I've already glazed over a ton of stuff that really has no consequence within the story. Their ship gets confiscated and they need to retrieve it from this weird alien dictator guy. Goku can use instant transmission because plot needs to happen and some random guy with big ears appears and knows that Goku is a Saiyan somehow based exclusively on his Kamehameha, an earth learned technique. And yes, now two episodes deep into this godforsaken subplot, they are still on this damn planet. And there's more! By the time the third episode in this mini arc comes around, I notice that an absurd amount of time has been spent not gathering the Dragon Balls. You know, the balls that if you don't gather them will bring about the Earth's destruction somehow? Rigiv, the big-eared alien guy that recognized Goku as a Saiyan, begins to fight Goku. It's a really short fight, but honestly, it's fine. It's definitely the best part of the show so far, but was only like two minutes long. I didn't really care about the fight, I don't care about Rigiv, but it was better than looking at like 95% of what the show has put in front of me so far. My issue with this mini arc within this saga I'm watching can be summed up in one word. Pointless. The last three episodes could be removed entirely and the only thing that would be lost is the little robot guy. And he could have been introduced or incorporated into the story in a bunch of other ways. We didn't learn anything new about Pan or Trunks or Goku from this story's inclusion. Six episodes deep and we're finally close to the first Dragon Ball and it's the worst one so far. They land in this planet where everything is like Earth except giant. Pan gets taken by a bunch of bees for most of the episode and a giant accidentally takes the Dragon Ball and lodges it in its tooth. Pan gets rescued and Goku retrieves the ball by being the giant's dentist. None of this is important. The only thing you need to know is that they have one Dragon Ball now. Next. The next two episodes, yes two, are spent within a mini arc again. Fun. The story itself revolves around this village that are seemingly being tormented by this fat, ugly, annoying catfish monster. A monster that claims to cause earthquakes. In order to not anger the beast and to solve the problem, the gang decides that the best course of action is to dress Trunks like a girl and to offer him as a bride to the monster. It turns out that the beast cannot cause earthquakes but can only sense when they are going to happen. Which makes no sense considering the perfect timing the earthquakes have in the story shown up. But let's ignore that. They beat him up, they stop a volcano or something, and just as the Dragon Ball is about to be handed over, out of nowhere some blue guy in a red unitard steals the second Dragon Ball they spent two agonizingly slow episodes retrieving. I feel cheated. There is so much useless motion in this series, but however, I spoke too soon. What follows this is the main plot of the arc, and it's probably the worst anime anything I've ever seen. I'm going to try my best at describing what happens and why I have a problem with it. I cannot promise I won't get angry. They begin chasing after the unitards that stole the Dragon Ball until they get lost in a big worm boulder. Don't ask. Turns out a large group of bad guys are looking for the Dragon Balls across the universe, without any means of tracking them down no less. First of all, how did they know the Dragon Balls were out there now? They only became viable like last week. Additionally, if they did know about them, why not go to where they were created on Earth first before all this happened? Also, the odds of these Unitard guys coincidentally running into our gang as they found a Dragon Ball with the help of a Dragon Radar is astronomical. The person that was looking for the ball seems to be this witch doctor that uses a whip to turn people into dolls so that he can sacrifice them to this creature called loot. However, once the witch doctor receives the Dragon Ball from the Unitards, he scolds them for not getting the other Dragon Ball that the gang had. Hold up. How does this guy know where the Dragon Balls are now? If he knows where they are, then why were the bad guys searching around the universe for them blind? It might sound like I'm skipping over a ton of stuff here. I'm sure a lot of you are saying, what? No, there must be more to this than just that. I'm sorry, there's really not. I'm doing my best to glaze over what isn't necessary and to focus on the main plot points as they stagger into my field of view here. For instance, do you want me to go in depth with this episode and explain how the Unitards go back to the worm ball and control the gang with dancing for literally minutes and minutes of screen time? Oh, you touch my time. 
No. And neither do I, because this is the worst episode of Dragon Ball I've ever seen. The episode ends with Pan getting into trouble, shocking, accidentally trying to fly the unitard spaceship to Lude's planet. Why? Because plot needs to happen. Episode 11, long story short. Pan gets captured slash turned into a doll, don't ask it's a long story. Teal finds the guys and they come to rescue her. A giant robot line is introduced and in seconds is destroyed by Goku. Where did it come from? Doesn't matter. The explosion itself wipes out the witch doctor guy holding the whip, but wait, the whip is alive and turns into a golden whip warrior thing. Episode 12, so we're introduced to the real boss now, I guess, and it's this weird alien guy with a soccer mom haircut fawning over doll Pan so delicately. Pretty convenient, isn't it, how he decided to hang on to Pan instead of throwing her into the pot like he did with the rest of the other worshippers? The weird alien with the soccer mom haircut begins undressing doll Pan and makes this face. I think this is the worst thing I've seen in a very long time. Now if you were to ask me, why is he doing all of this? Why does he want to resurrect Lude? I literally could not tell you. But Lude is finally activated! Episode 13. A dumb looking pale green alien robot baby reveals itself and it's Lude in all of his glory. Why does it have a flabby chest with nipples? No idea. And it turns out the soccer mom haircut wearing alien otaku guy isn't the real boss either. This guy Dr. Mew is. I, I gotta say this now, there have been like 30 different boss reveals. First the person that stole the ball, then the leader of his group, then the witch doctor, then the whip, then the whip turned into a golden monster. Monster, then the weird doll otaku guy with the soccer mom haircut, and now Dr. Mew. This is incomprehensibly bad. So it turns out Lude is being controlled by this Dr. Mew, someone that looks like an unlockable reskin of Dr. Jiro from Dragon Ball Fighters. In the end, the Unitards come back and start dancing again. No! The fight between Lude and the team of Goku and Trunks is boring, and ultimately Pan and the weird alien guy get absorbed by Lude. And believe it or not, I actually remember this part from when I was a kid. Pan and Goku need to coordinate their attack to the same area, one shot from the inside and one from the outside. And if my memory served me right, it's pretty dumb. Yep, and it sure is. The para para unitards who have all been absorbed by Lude too can conveniently communicate via telepathy to Goku on the outside. I hate this show. I, I really hate this show. Can I stop now? Eventually, they hit Lude right in the sweet spot at the exact same time to defeat him. While this was happening, Lude was just standing there, not defending himself, waiting to be attacked by Goku. It's at this point in the story I realize they've only retrieved two Dragon Balls and I feel a tremendous sadness descend upon me. The following two remaining episodes are essentially filler or setup for the later antics in the next arc. Episode 15 covers the guys landing on a desert planet with Pan getting into trouble being saved by Gil, which as it happens is my favorite episode from this arc. It's got nothing to do with the awful main plot, it's self-contained, it sets up the conflict between Pan and Gil early and despite Pan treating Gil horribly, he still goes out to save her. Crazy to think that the most resonant heroic moment from this series so far for me has being through a tiny plot device, MacGuffin Robot. Episode 16, on the other hand, the final episode in this arc, covers the gang landing on Gil's home planet as he seemingly betrays them. Goku and Trunks get captured for a change, and Pan is then left alone. And that concludes the Black Star Dragon Ball Saga. What a mess. Of the 16 episodes that made up the story, I could easily see it streamlined down to 10 episodes if you remove the episodes with unrelated material. But even saying that, the main plotline seemed, to me at least, confused and ultimately it lacked direction. On June of 2005, producer Kozo Morishita had an interview where he discussed the production of Dragon Ball GT. In an effort to retain the golden time slot of 7pm every Wednesday, the brass behind Dragon Ball decided to create a new series in GT that would cover the exploits of the next generation in Pan and Trunks. This was part of the reasoning for changing Goku to a kid, to keep him in theme with the younger generation. Dragon Ball GT itself wanted to bring Dragon Ball back to its roots with an adventure-centric storyline, and they definitely did that here. However, Dragon Ball didn't just decide to go from lighthearted adventure centric storytelling to galactic wide battles with world ending stakes in literally one episode. Dragon Ball gradually over the course of a decade developed and advanced the story to naturally assume the stakes it did. GT currently as it stands already suffers from a lot of issues and growing pains were not something they needed on top of this laundry list of defects. And the production issues and lack of confidence in the product can be felt in this quote taken straight from that interview itself. Initially, we made about 26 episodes worth of rough plot outlines, but around when the final script for episode 3 was finished, we thought, these travel episodes aren't going to be interesting no matter how long we keep them going, are they? And so, we stopped. 
That's why Gil and the spaceship stopped appearing midways through. It's clear from just watching it that it had no idea of what it wanted to be. One second they're doing wacky adventures throughout space for kids, and another second they're doing big battles, followed by more tone-deaf slapstick with creepy undertones. It's all over the place and I'm really not a fan of it. The entire story is filled with scenarios where I can see the writer in various circumstances writing themselves out of a corner. Whether it be through Pan getting into specific kinds of trouble to influence the main cast into dangerous situations, the bad guys randomly deciding not to do away with Pan as a doll, that catfish monster having earthquakes with perfect comedic timing, or the unitards knowing telepathy without which the situation would be entirely lost. Additionally, the writing is extremely formulaic and lazy. In that very same interview, Morishita said, Pan's role was to be strong but still lose to the enemies and then be rescued by Goku, a heroine who makes Goku a hero. Dragon Ball GT has an episode where Pan is turned into a doll, but that episode established the pattern of Pan sets the incident in motion while Goku resolves it. And that's Dragon Ball GT in a nutshell. Extremely contrived, formulaic, predictable, and demonstrably, unforgivably, relentlessly boring. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. This is still only one part of a bigger four-part picture. In the next episodes, I will be covering the remaining seasons of Dragon Ball GT as it spiraled into cancellation and obscurity. How did this happen? Was it as bad as people claim today? Or was it overblown and it actually had its merits? Only one way to find out, and I'm happy to bear that cross. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe and leave a like. It really makes a massive difference. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you so much for watching.